Hey everybody, CyberTop back with you with all things chess. Uh, we're continuing our examination of hanging pawns today. We're doing a very sharp positional duel between a leg Romanishin and Lev Sakis. Um, both these guys deserve, deserve a lot more attention in modern chess, in my opinion. Uh, Lev Sakis, uh, in the early 80s, he tied for first in the Soviet Championship twice. Uh, that was at a time when the Soviet Championship was on the regular. One of the strongest, if not the strongest, tournament in the world every year, consistently. Um, tying for first twice is a huge achievement. His tie for first in 1981, he tied with Kasparov, and he beat them in their individual game. Um, that was before Kasparov went full Super Saiyan in the late 80s, early 90s, but even at that time, he was one of the strongest grandmasters in the world. Uh, Oleg Romanishin, not as many practical results as Lev Sakis, but far more important as a theoret theoretician. He left his mark on so many positions in modern theory. Um, he was heavily invested in uh, early versions of the uh, Berlin Spanish, uh, so if you want to blame him for that opening, he deserves at least some blood. Um, he left a huge mark in the Nimzo Indian, so my I play the Nimzo Indian as black, so a lot of the ideas that I deal with in my repertoire are a direct result of Oleg Ramonishin. Um, it's hard to overestimate his importance as a theoretician. So, Ramonishin's white here against Sakas, not a three. B6. This basically guarantees we're either going to get to a Queen's Indian or a Hedgehog. And I'll show you the difference between those two openings. So, white plays D4. This basically guarantees we're getting into a Queen's Indian. <clears throat> Knight C3 would keep the options open. Uh, but if white chooses not to play d4 immediately, this can lead to a hedgehog. Or let me just get to sort of a basic theoretical position. Um, this is one of the main lines of the hedgehog. It's called the hedgehog because these pawns in a6, b6, d6, and e6 sort of form the spines of the hedgehog. So it's controlling all of these squares in the fifth rank. So it's like the the prickly pair that white is afraid to push into because he has those uh, spines of pawns set up. Um, this is different than most modern opening theories. That it, this is a very theoretical, theoretically heavy position, but it's not like the Sicilian knife or from the dragon that's like sh super sharp theory. The theory is much more positional and precise and based on very subtle niceties. Um, it's just as theoretical as any of those openings. It's just an entirely different tenor of position in most instances. Um, but in the game, d4, that basically means we're getting into a Queen's Indian. g3, bishop a6. So this is... Uh, this was actually one of Nimzovich's original ideas for the position. Um, bishop b7 would be the more classical-looking Queen's Indian. Uh, bishop a6 actually... Almost as many games in my database as bishop b7, but it actually scores significantly better. Um, I would guess it's... Because black is simply putting more direct pressure on white's position. Typically, whenever you can play aggressively, it pays off. Playing aggressive chess nearly always pays off. So black is immediately asking a, a white a question of how he's going to defend that c4 pawn. Uh, in the game, white chooses knight bd2. Um, the knight's a little bit more passive than it would be on c3, but it still controls the e4 square, and it still it defends the c4 pawn, so it's a quite useful move. The main modern preference is b3, but white's never really achieved much of anything here. This is the modern main line. Um, and the bishop on a6 actually makes a good amount of sense. You know, it's a, attacking this e-pawn. This e-pawn is typically a little bit loose for white in these sorts of structures, so the bishop on a6 is actually doing good work. It's certainly better placed than it would be on b7, where it's just sort of hitting the granite of its own pawn on d5. Uh, but knight bd2... I, I won't necessarily say it's better than b3, but it tends to leave white with a little bit more flexibility. So d5, bishop g2, bishop b7. Notice that dxc4. This is a common mistake for black in these sorts of Catalan Queen's Indian positions. You don't want to abandon the center this quickly. Uh, castle is the correct move. I look at knight e5 in the game notes. This is just a mistake from white. Uh, castle. And this is very much in the style of the Catalan opening. White is very comfortable here. Now, black has abandoned his one bastion in the center. Um, black has control of the e4 square for now, but that's going to be in the main battle coming up, is that white's going to arrange his pieces tr to try to enforce e4. And it's going to be hard for black to prevent that long term. Once white gets e4 in, his advantage will be more or less 
evident. But Bishop e7 is correct, just leaving that bastion intact. Castle, knight e5. So this is a very typical move in these structures. The bishop on g2 is white's most important piece. So white immediately unmasks that bishop so it can start pressuring black's center. Uh, plus the knight on f3 isn't really accomplishing anything, so white's bringing it to a better track to try to attack black's center, to, to attack the uh, almost certainly forthcoming hanging pawns. It can reroute to f4. That's a pretty common route for it. Um, black plays c5. So this is... Uh, one of the main things I always like to go over in training sessions with students is always look to your pawn breaks. Pawn breaks are the most important thing that you can be looking at a position for your activity and your plans. Uh, if you're not achieving your pawn breaks, you're most likely just passively shuffling your pieces. And if your position doesn't have any pawn breaks, unless you have piece activity, you're typically going to be on uh, your back feet playing path defensively. Um, and this, this position, black is basically fated to play c5 at some points. Uh, it is his only pawn break. He needs to be fighting for the center somehow, so c5 makes uh, complete sense. So excellent play from black. White immediately takes. b3, this is a little bit loose, um, but it's not bad at all. Uh, white plays a little bit uh, more passively to tr just try to finish his development. Knight DC, this is an interesting move. It doesn't completely work out, though. Uh, white certainly doesn't get an advantage from this. Uh, but this is the sort of aggressive chess you want to be playing against the hanging pawns. Um, in theory, this is an excellent move. Just in practice, practice here, the tactics don't work out for white. Um, Knight BD7 is the correct move. I go over rookie 8 in the notes. It just doesn't work out for black. Because um, knight e3, you're just getting the pressure on the d5 pawn immediately. So knight bd7 finishes developments and immediately challenges that knight on e5. Knight c6, queen e8. Knight e3, taking an e7 would be disastrous. And white's position is already collapsing. Uh, that pawn on e2, the knight can't move because the pawn on e2 would be hanging. Um, if the bishop takes on a8, you can just take back on a8, and then white still has the same problem. So knight e3 is correct. And this is a very sharp position. Basically, white has the bishop pair, and black has these theoretical pawn weaknesses. But it's completely balanced out. In, in, in practice, I would say more than balances out for with black's huge edge in development, huge edge in space. White's position is very passive. His development's poor. Um, theoretically, I think black is fine. I think that or white's fine. This is a balanced position. But I think, in practice, a position like this is just dreadful to play for white. Uh, white's going to be spending a lot of time untangling in the hopes of someday playing an endgame against these pawns, which you'll most likely never get. So, um, I do prefer Romanovich's choice of just finishing development. He recognizes he can't get an immediate knockout blow. In the games of the great players, you'll see over and over, they just choose to finish development and finish mobilization. You're rarely going to see strong players just playing with only half their pieces. Finish your development when you can. Bishop e7. Bishop d2. e4 immediately. And this has been sort of the focus of our examination. This is immediately possible. It's not necessary, but it's also decent. Um, Knight c4 would be the critical try, in my opinion. Um, and White's down a pawn, but he has humongous compensation for the pawn. You know, he has a lead in development. That lead on development will be exacerbated with a rook coming into the d-file. Um, this is an excellent position for White. A queen c7 is another try. Um, theoretically, I think this is balanced, and we can compare this position to what we get in the game. But I think practically White's better here, because all of White's pieces are, have a role. So this knight is beautiful on d3, this knight can hop to c4 at some point, this rook's going to go to c1, this rook's going to go to e1, this bishop's going to go to a3. All of white's pieces have a clear role. All of his his next five or six moves are very clear. This isn't a hard position for white to play, whereas practically for black, he's going to be the one making the tough decisions. And that's going to lead to errors creeping into the game eventually, for black. Um, again, I think this is theoretically balanced. I think... You know, this, this d-pawn is a strong pawn. That's sort of the, the downside to playing the e4 pawn break against the hanging pawns, is that this d-pawn really is a strength. You know, it gobbles up space, 
But look at this beautiful knight on d3 and that soon to be beautiful knight on c4. That's the drawback to having to play d4. Um, but bishop, d, bishop b2 was played. This isn't bad, of course. Finished development. a5. e4. I'd actually prefer rook c1 a little bit in this particular position. Just, again, finishing development and trying to pressure the hanging pawns with pieces first. Knight d3. And this leads to a long forced variation. Uh, 96 is possible also, but this this is a very nice position for whites. E4 is going to have even more strength in a position like this. Uh, but this leads to a long variation that I'll just briefly demonstrate. And this is a symbolic advantage for whites. I don't think... This is still well within the drawing margin. I think if two equally strong players are, are playing each other in this position, I think this is going to be a draw. But white is the one only one that can win this position. This is playing for two results only. So, e4 keep, it develops more strategic tension. So, d4. So, again, this is sort of the basic e4 against the hanging pawns position. Um, this pawn in d4 is a strength. Absolutely. It's a pass pawn. It's gobbling up space. In this particular position, it's blunting out this bishop on b2. So, this is absolutely a strength for black. The downside is that these pawns are securely blockaded. There's no way for those pawns to really march forward at all. Um, that leaves those squares in C4 and D3 completely open for white pieces to very comfortably occupy. That's the downside. In this particular position, I think it's perfectly balanced. It's just sort of, they just sort of balance each other out equally. Um, but it just depends on the specifics of the position. Um, that's why... When you play a move like e4, it's setting the strategic tone for the rest of the game. So it has pluses and minuses, and you want to evaluate based on the specific position. And that's often going to be how quickly you can get your pieces to those blockade squares, whether black has another pawn break to try to break that, break that blockade. Um, if you can get your own counterplay on the king side going instead of just passively blockading. Those are all going to be factors, and it's going to depend on the specifics. Um, here, when Ashton plays knight ec4, I think this is wrong. Knight d3 looks better to me, just because it leaves that other knight going to its natural post on c4. Whereas after ec4, this knight in d2 doesn't really have a great post. Knight fd7. Knight c4. Queen d8, this is pretty passive. This is a closed position, so spending extra moves and maneuvering has a lower cost than a wide open position in a wide open position there's much more many more tactics and many more direct threats against your king so the value of each move is a little bit higher here the position is closed up so each side can afford to be a little bit more ornate in their maneuvering um but here i think queen d8 is just way too passive queen e6 <clears throat> is just way more logical to me a4 is black's pawn break here again always look to your pawn breaks uh, A4 is Black's main bid for activity. It's opening up that rook and A file, and it's trying to weaken this knight on C4. And Queen E6 keeps an eye on that knight on C4, so A4 has a little bit more oomph to it. Uh, one example line. And Black has perfectly good play here. This is a balanced position. Uh, Queen D8 is just way too passive. Bishop C1. This is a logical redeployment. This bishop on B2 was just hitting that granite on D4. So it's just immediately redeploying to get to a better post. Excellent chess. Bishop d2, a4, immediately is a little bit more accurate because it immobilizes that pawn on a5. And this is a ragged position. I mean, both, both sides have strategic chances here, but I think white's slightly more comfortable. He's going to move this bishop to f1 to help control those light squares um, and then continue to redeploy his pieces effectively. I think white's a little bit better here. Uh, rook a6, this is a clear mistake. a4, again, always look to your pawn breaks. When you can achieve a pawn break for activity, typically you just want to do it and get that activity going. Uh, here it's it's clearly just the best move. Just at helping activate this rook on the a file, trying to weaken this uh, very strong knight support on c4, that's the best move. Rook a6 is just too passive. a4, so... White robs Black of his chance to play his only pawn break. So here, White basically has a permanent edge, just because Black doesn't really have any counterplay at all. Uh, and this pawn on a5 is a permanent target as well. Queen a8, this is a very common move for both sides of the board, uh, the ready and the English. 
Um, helping defend that pawn on a5, developing pressure on the long diagonal. Excellent move. Queen c2. Push me down. Again, this is too passive. Knight b6, we need to challenge this knight in c4 somehow. Uh, the downside to the pawn break e4 for the hanging pawns is that you get the strong blockade against the hanging pawns. Knight b6 at least challenges that blockade. So it's sort of speaking to the strate strategic demands of this position. Um, so bishop d8 just way too passive. Bishop f4, bishop f1. N the bishop on g2 didn't really have a role anymore. So that bishop is going to redeploy to d3 where it sort of aims at the white, uh, black king side. So excellent choice. F3, not essential. Basically the idea is that it's locking up this long diagonal for black so it doesn't really have a role. But long term, you really want to play f4 in this position. So bishop d3 is just better. Just, it does the same thing. It guards upon an e4. Just keeps f4 available as a one tempo move instead of playing f3 then f4. Queen e8. Again, this is just sort of illogical shuffling. Rook e8. Just finish your developments. That that was black's last undeveloped piece. Get in the game. Bishop d2. Again, this is just... Aimless shuffling. Black needs to try to organize, either gain activity. There's no activity for Black to gain here, though, because he did, he never played a4, so he doesn't have any pawn breaks to achieve activity. So Black needs to mobilize his pieces for the defense. So Queen e8 at least puts some pressure in White's position when he plays f4. Six might be six again. The downside to the blockade, or playing e4, and then. Hanging pawns getting d4 and it is the blockade of these hanging pawns. So challenge the strong knight in c4. That's white's best piece. So if black is able to trade it off, that's a huge game for black. But rook e8, again, this is just passive shuffling. Bishop d3, continue to reorganize. Excellent choice. Rook e2, both sides are being very indirect here. f4 is just better. Just get those pawns moving. Um, along with your pawn breaks... Moving your pawn majorities is often going to be the key to achieving your goals in the position. Um, here, white just needs to get these kingside pawns moving forward. Just start flooding black's kingside with activity. Rookie 2 just doesn't. It's too indirect. So knight b8. This is a good choice heading for the b4 square, but it's a little bit too late. f4, excellent choice. Knight b4. So this is a good position to talk about. So this is a common transition from the e4, d4, break against the hanging pawns. Uh, white still has a huge advantage here. Um, this no So this is a good example of a position where the bishop pair means nothing. Neither of these bishops are stronger than this knight on c4. This is white's best piece. It's incredibly strong. It blocks off the open c-file, so that's not an asset for black. It stares at this weak pawn on a5. Um, this is an almost decisive advantage for white, because this pawn on d4 is still completely immobile. It's not an asset for black. Um, whereas these kingside pawns are completely mobile. White's just going to threaten to sweep those kingside pawns forward and gain an unstoppable attack on the kingside. Queen b1, this is just way too indirect. h4, get your pawns moving. h8, queen d2. And then white can continue to mobilize. You can play a move like rook h2, prepare for the h5 pawn break. Or just play e5 and play for that. Either way, white's much better here, if not decisively better. Queen b1 is just too indirect. Too indirect, and this is putting white's advantage in danger, finally. Again, h4, get your pawns moving. You, you want to develop that active play against your opponent. Queen e1, and the queen sort of reorganizes herself back to support either e5, e6, or shift over to rook h2 and get h5 going. But rook d2 actually puts white's advantage in danger here. Bishop c5, this this move doesn't accomplish anything. It It's just biting on the ground of its own d4 pawn. Rook c5 is better, because it's combining, combining attack with defense. It's defending this weak a5 pawn. It's sort of holding this whole fifth rank against any pawn breaks, like h4, h5. Um, and it's also planning some activity. So queen e1, queen d7, and queen h3, and suddenly... Black has ideas like h5, h4, followed by rook h5. And this bishop on b7 is always going to keep white honest. He can't just rush forward with e5 in every position, because that bishop will be incredibly strong. Um, this almost looks completely balanced. Whether bishop c5 it just 
misses the opportunity completely. Rookie one, again, H4. Get your pawns moving. That Basically, when you blockade the hanging pawns, that's when you start thinking about developing play on the other side of the board. When white has those hanging pawns securely blockaded, or in this position, the isolated pawns securely blockaded, that's when you want to start developing your play on the side of the board where you're mobile. Yates. Two passive. Again, broken record. H4. Get, get your play moving. Uh, King g7. This is just sort of shuffling. Queen, Bishop b6. Actually, plan, this plans a specific defensive device, which I think is import, important to highlight. And then rook xc4. This is the perfect time to play this move because bishop xc4 isn't available. If bishop x, uh, c4 were available, this wouldn't be so great. But here, bxc4 is forced from white. Again, white can't play that because of d3 check. So dx c4, but now white's pawn structure is completely shattered. So after bishop c5, suddenly black has this incredibly strong pass pawn and b4 to go with this pass pawn on d4. So that immobilizes white's pieces somewhat. Black has the bishop pair, which sort of helps keep these kingside pawns immobile. You know, e5 always comes at the cost of opening this incredibly dangerous long diagonal. So after something like rook f2, black can actually play f5 here. Ex f5 isn't available because of rook e3. And this is actually a winning position for black. Um, because black just has very simple threats of queen d7 and queen c6. And there's nothing that white can really do to stop this. So e5 is forced here. Then after h5 to stop g4, uh, it's going to be hard to make progress here. I think white has a little bit of an advantage, but I think objectively this is going to be a draw. Because this pass pawn in b, uh, b4 sort of keeps white honest. None of white's pieces can really move away from their post too much because black has too much potential counterplay. If this bishop moves, d3 comes. If this queen moves over to the uh, king side, suddenly the pawn could start marching. Or queen d7, queen c6 could come to mate on, on the long diagonal. Um, so this was a real chance for black to change the, con the texture of the position. And just remember an exchange sacrifice like this. Um... In this position, a, a rook is not stronger than that knight. That knight on c4 is the best piece on the board. So in a lot of positions like this, you should be thinking about ways to get rid of this knight. We saw in a lot of earlier variations, black needing to challenge that knight with his own knight by playing knight b6. Here, black doesn't have that knight anymore, so it's sort of an emergency button that he's hitting. Just to sacrifice the exchange to get that strong piece off the board. King g7 doesn't accomplish anything defensively. It's just a king shuffle. h3... Slow, but it's still progress. King h2, e5 is just more direct, especially now that the rook is blocking the long diagonal. Six. Queen c2, that's a that's a mistake. e5. Again, you want to get your play going. Uh, now that the king's off this diagonal, e, e5 is safer because bishop e4 is a resource. Queen c2. Bishop a7. Um, this is a passive mistake. Again, this is just way too much shuffling. F6 puts up the defensive barricades. E4, E5 is black or white's main positional threat here. So black tries to put up resistance against that pawn move. E5. And I think black is perfectly solid here. There's no immediate kingside breakthrough for white. Um, and black can finally trade off that incredibly strong knight. Um, plus, black will always have his own counterplay, because this bishop on b7 is quite strong. Bishop a7 is just, again, it, it's shuffling the pieces without recourse. Black needs to be thinking about either his own counterplay, or the, putting up barricades against white's own plan. So f6 is aimed at e5, since that's main, white's main push here. Bishop a7 doesn't do anything. e5 finally gets things moving. Bishop f3, uh, this is the decisive error. Bishop b8 at least gets the piece back in the game. So it's it's aimed at the kingside pawns to try to develop counterplay once... It helps prevent, or at least discourage a move like uh, f5. So move like queen b2. And black is holding for now. I think white still has a good edge here. Uh, but nothing immediately decisive is a 
it. Uh, black can play this position for a while if he needs to. Whereas bishop, bishop f3 just loses more time. And then finally, this is a decisive pawn break. White has a decisive initiative here. Rook x5. Queen d2. Now the black king is just way too open. This, is, this game is over. Bishop c5. Rook f6. Rook ef1 is fine too, but rook f6 is fancy. Uh, if the rook takes... That's a tactical point. So rook h5 is played. Queen f4. And then g4. Black resigns here. The rook is completely trapped. And then white's white's attack will not lessen in ferocity once I, um, once he loses the rook. So this uh, black resigned here. Um, the main positional point of this game, this position I want to go back to review, this moment here at e4, this is the pawn break that we've been studying. Uh, and our travel so far. Um, this is very difficult to judge because there's so many positional principles at stake here. So after this d4 move, it's hard to judge who's going to be better off because there's so many long-term positional factors. You know, This pawn in d4, it's both a strength and a weakness because now these light squares are completely emaciated, but it's also gobbling up space and it's a strong pass pawn in its own right. It really just depends on the specifics of the position. Now here, that e3 would have been better. This is as, about as ideal as a position as you can get for white, because those white's pieces are all swarming to their blockade squares immediately. Um, but black is still doing okay, in my opinion, because this pawn in d4 is perfectly strong. Uh, black has his own counterplay with a4, and black can always threaten to trade off the coming knight in c4 with something like knight fd7, knight b6. Um, but really the key... This moment here. a4. Um, always look to prevent your opponent's uh, pawn breaks. Bishop d2 is inaccurate because it allowed a4 to be achieved, where black would have a perfectly good share of the play. Rook a6 was a huge positional error because after a4... Suddenly, the blockade of the hanging pawns is the only factor of the position. Black doesn't have any other pawn breaks. There's no play for black, because these are so well blockaded. Now, the rest, of the, the rest of the game was just white, and this took a while because both sides were sort of aimlessly shuffling. Um, but the rest of the game was just white slowly building up for a kingside attack, because there's no pawn breaks on the queen side. Black can't develop any counterplay to distract white. So the rest of the game is just white building up for that kingside attack, that eventually comes to fruition. And both sides were a little bit inaccurate, but the rest of the game was still sort of a logical fulfillment of this moment here. Because after a4, black has no pawn breaks, and if you have no pawn breaks, you're going to be playing passively. If you're going to be playing passively, your opponent's just going to build up and attack at leisure. And that's exactly what Ramonishin did here, with a, eventually a quite pretty attack on the king's side. So... Um, excellent positional game. We're going to continue our study of hanging pawns. We're going to start looking at other pawn breaks other than e4 uh, in our next few games. So my name is John. I'll see you then.